Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Doing great, Dr. Newton. Thank you for having me today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for agreeing to chat with me. I really appreciate that. I'm going to ask you two questions. I'm going to ask you to tell us your name and to uh, share anything you, about yourself you feel comfortable sharing, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, good morning. My name is Michelle Campbell, and I'm the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Middlesex College here in Edison, New Jersey. I've been with the institution for almost four years, we four years in July. And um, I oversee all the, I, I say that I have like the fun job when people are like, oh, what does advancement mean? Um, so I get to do all the fun things. I, I get to uh, work with the, with the community. I oversee marketing and communications and web development. Uh, I uh, have workforce development as part of my portfolio our foundation and events management grants. And then we also have two urban satellite centers in New Brunswick and Perth Amboy uh, that were really are sort of hubs for uh, working with those communities and the surrounding communities. So those are also areas that fall under my purview. Excellent. So, so that's where I'm currently at. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask you about your wonderful weather in New Jersey in a minute, but I want to ask you this question. What does typically we think of institutional advancement or development as people who raise money for an organization? Is it still that kind of concept or is it something a little different now? Has it evolved? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's very dependent on what the institution's needs are. So there are, you know, in a university setting, in a four year institution, setting. I'm at a two-year institution, so it can vary a little bit more. Uh, in a four-year institution setting, it's still very much that traditional alumni development, fundraising, and donor relations is really where the focus is. Oftentimes, you may see a sprinkling of communications and marketing over a site as well. In the two-year space, you, you're going to see it'll span the gamut, and it really depends on what the institution's needs are and how they've sort of organized and structured um, um, they're, you know, the, the institution at the top. So uh, you'll see in some institutions where it still is very traditional, where you'll have alumni fundraising, grants and marketing. Uh, at my previous institution, Renton Technical College, they had a similar model to what we have at Middlesex College on a smaller scale, um, but it was a larger scope. And so I think that the position is evolving uh, and uh, it really, it, again, it, I think it really just depends on what the institution's needs are and the opportunities that they see that, you know, the advancement um, sort of uh, specialty can, to, can bring to the institution. Excellent. Thank you for that. We often hear the word endowment, and uh, probably for those of us on the outside of the department of that group, we just think is the endowment is this big pot of money that alumni and various organizations just give to the university. And then that endowment is distributed as the university leadership sees fit. And some of it is goes to scholarships. Can you just tell us to, correctly what the definition of endowment is, how is endowment used, and what's the purpose of endowments in maintaining a university stability? That's a great question. So, um, you know, again, all institutions probably manage their endowment and what their endowment entails how they pay out that endowment on an annual basis is, is different. Yes. And each foundation board will determine what that entails and um, through their policies and, and procedures. Uh, and it also depends on uh, the nature of the institution. So at a public institution, like the institutions I've worked at, um, we have a separate 501c3 foundation uh, and they manage our endowment. Uh, whereas at a private institution uh, that holds its own 501c3, they don't have to have a separate foundation. So there are some dynamics, uh, differences between public institutions that have foundations that manage their fundraising and their, their endowments versus private institutions who really have honestly like more ownership of uh, what they use the endowment for and um, maybe how that how that uh, operation is run. But basically an endow endowment is, is, it is a large pot of money um, to a degree uh, because that pot is obviously distributed or segmented in different ways. Uh, I'll give you an example. So at, at, our, at Middlesex College, we have about a, just under a $25 million endowment. Uh, some of that is um, permanently endowed 
which means it's permanently, um, you know, there and we only take a certain percentage off of it. And then we have some that are quasi endowed. Um, and so, uh, and then we have in organizations or, or individuals who say, I want to start an endowed scholarship, right? Which means that um, we, we decide that, okay, you can endow a scholarship at $30,000. That's our, our minimum amount. Uh, and basically what that means is when someone were, are, is to endow on a, a scholarship, for example, every year um, that scholarship will be able to provide, every year that endowment, that $30,000 endowment, dollar endowment will be able to provide scholarships for students at the percentage that the foundation board agrees to pay out at the endowment. So um, at Middlesex this past year, our board approved a 4% payout. So, you know, um, it, you know, so that is like 23 million of, of 4%, then that's how you sort of determine um, how much of each scholarship, of each endowed scholarship is paid out, how much of a general endowment is paid out and what you have for scholarship and program support. Excellent. In addition, so it's, to a, it's a little complicated, and I, I tried to simplify it as much as possible. And there's a lot of back end financial related things that, um, and the larger the endowment, places like Harvard and Princeton and Yale, um, I am completely dumbing down what what their endowments entail and the, the complexity of, of how they manage those. Excellent. Well, now we know what endowment are and we are we learned a little bit of math in the process <laughs> we got two for the price of one thank you for that so going back to the endowment piece and i promise we won't talk about this forever i just want to get so going back to the endowment piece so if i understand and, and i worked for several universities and had a little bit of exposure to that but in in some instances where there's an endowment so the endowment has pots in it if you will where, okay, so let's just say uh, one of your benefactors gives you $25 million and that endow, and he may have, or she may have a designation for that endowment. In other words, they only, they don't want you to pay salaries out of it or they don't want you to give student scholarship <laughs> or do work on the property or something, the criteria like that. And, and then somebody else comes along and just writes you a check for $25 million just to your, your organization and hands free. They don't want any more involvement whatsoever. And as that process goes along, there's no commingling of those specified funds unless you worked out terms with the benefit, <laughs> benefit, the person who gives it to you. And then the money that's in the generic, you can have you have more control over. It. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, to a degree. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. so where does alumni tie into that? And and I know that sounds a very simple question, but what I'm like I most people who graduate from their schools and have a fairly good experience is you contribute to their school once they graduate and get into the workforce. How does the money that alumni give affect the endowment, if at all? And how does universities and colleges recruit their alumni to give money for pro products and programs they're trying to install? Yeah, I think it, it's a couple of things. Um, um, institutions engage their alums in several ways. When it comes to uh, fundraising and giving, uh, for example, we have a, at Middlesex College, we have uh, an alumni scholarship. It's not endowed. Um, actually, it is endowed. It is endowed because it's, a, it's about a $60,000 endowment. So it's small compared to what you would see at a large institution, a large four-year institution. Um, but um, it took them some time to get it to an endowed level. So it started out as an annual scholarship, which basically means, you know, they're, they're, they're saying they'll, they'll give X amount annually. And then, um, you know, they want to give scholarships of, let's say they're going to raise $2,000 annually and they'll give out one $500 scholarship a year. Right. So that means every year they're, they're building it to $1,500. So over time, once it, it, it reaches that $30,000 or whatever the endowment number is, the minimum for the institution, it can then be endowed. Uh, and then that's when it sort of um, is something that we, we see as, you know, has more longevity than just uh, an annual scholarship. Um, so, Thing, again, things are very different in the two-year space than they are in the four-year space. Um, 
you know, four year institutions often when it comes to their alumni, their alumni span the gamut, right? So they have alumni that um, are come from similar backgrounds and populations to, to individuals who graduate from two year colleges. They also have alumni who are come from very wealthy families and everything in between and uh, alums that you know, finish college and go on to have these really high paying jobs. And those alums, um, you know, that have that uh, financial sort of backing have more of an opportunity to leverage those funds to A, assist the institution, but also have a voice in um, some of the operations of the institution, right? If they want to have more of a seat at the table, uh, having the financial means, uh, you know, will assist with that to some degree, especially if you're talking about building a new building and naming rights and things of that nature, uh, those all require a level of financial, um, you know, financial backing in order to be able to have that level of influence. That's interesting. Very interesting. So let me, let me ask you, uh, uh, um, I guess maybe a hypothetical question, but maybe not. So uh, I graduated from two universities. So I graduated from historically black college. I got three degrees from that university and I got my doctorate degree from predominantly white college. I am not a typical alum because I was not, I was a non-traditional student. I didn't get my doctor's degree till I was in my fifties and I'm only 19. Make sure we get that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> but um I give money to my historically black college and my, not my predominantly white college. And the reason when I was at my predominantly white college, I was, I, I, at least I think I was more aware of how things work, right? When I was at, at, at my historically black college, I just went along. Everybody, someone just shuffled me around, around and kept me going in the right direction. Whereas in my predominantly white college, I was seven digit number, um, whatever came up along the way, I had two or three people I could interact with, but just those two or three people to interact with to keep my career going. Now, I did my my doctorate in four degrees from start to finish. Started on year one, year four, I had my D, I had the doctorate, right? And that's somewhat unusual. Some people take much longer to get that thing, but but I did. But the whole time, I felt like I was an alien at that university. I felt like I didn't belong. And this this is a bit strange. At my historically black college, everybody knew my name, they knew my family, they knew my friends, they knew my life, right? And so when, if like, I, I remember I wrote a paper on uh, world religions. It was an awful, it was awful, it was just absolutely awful. And my instructor sat me down after class and she says, Rochelle, you're better than this. I'm gonna give you one more chance. If not, you're gonna get an F and you're gonna flunk out of my class. That kind of concern for my well being led me to believe and them and what they do. Whereas when I had struggles, nothing quite that bad at my doctor's degree, but still there was no one who corrected me other than my dissertation chair, who was wonderful at my predominantly white policy, but, but that was it. And do you think those kinds of experiences and others, you know, whether you get your refund or whether you get your room or dorm or whatever on time, do you think those kinds of experiences affect donations to uh, your alumni, your, your, your college and university? Absolutely. 100%. I mean, you really hit it on the money there with that experience, right? That personal touch is really important. And I think that, you know, some institutions, um, I don't, it's not that they don't see the importance of that, but I do think that at some institutions, some alums just get lost, right? They just get lost and uh, maybe they, you know, they just don't, um, you know, it's not as much of a, in the culture, right? The culture of the institution, the values of an institution uh, reflect in the day-to-day -day and how people treat each other, the, the people who work at the institution, but also how students are, are treated. And, um, and so I think it absolutely impacts. I, um, you know, similar to you, I have, I'm working on my final and third degree, uh, my doctorate, and I actually do not um, I do not support currently uh, my undergrad, my, my master's, or my, my doctorate institution, uh, but I do support the institutions I work for. And I have set up an annual scholarship at Middlesex College 
And I heavily supported Renton Technical College when I worked there and Northeast Community College when I worked there uh, because I believe in the mission of, in, of community colleges and because the, um, even the experience that I've had as an employer at these institutions <clears throat> is something that I feel more deeply connected to than what I got at you know, my alma maters. So you're absolutely right. It, it does impact, we hear that a lot from students. We have uh, donors and alums of Middlesex who say that when they um, think about, you know, they give to here and not to Rutgers, for example, because they believe that Middlesex College is the reason why they are where they are today. And without having taken the step here first before launching to, you know, their four-year degree and on to medical school or whatever, that they never would have gotten um, the education and the, the, you know, the foundation that they needed to really thrive and be who they are today. That's such a powerful statement. Uh, we're going to have to highlight that in, when we present this because that's so true. And I know, and I think that maybe, maybe originally, and I talked about this previously, but the institution of education started out as a public good, right, to make the world better. It has become so competitive, competitive among universities for students for everything, right? So um, I work. I retired from Duke uh, this past September. If you would have looked, walked on Duke's campus to see the a place where the students eat, it's a gothic kind of shaped building, a lot of history, big, you know, everything. Um, a few years ago, I think in 2016, something like that, they redid it. It looks like it belongs at a museum. It does not belong at a college campus. But what came along with that are increased prices for food, you know, maintaining the space, all of these things. And I honestly believe that when universities invest that kind of money, you know, with the exception of maybe sports where they invested to get more people to come into the game, you know, maybe it's the same theory, but they built this wonderful space for children to eat to increase, to make the university more attractive because Duke was built very many years ago, built on that old architecture and all of that stuff. So they wanted to modernize. And the more they modernize, the more they are to reach students. And of course, as long as their basketball team wins, that helps too. But um, in, in essence, why is that com competition among universities specifically for dollars? Why is that? Why do they not all see each other as partners in the public good? You know, um... The biggest reason why I think there, well, not the biggest, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons is because, you know, the, the foundation of, of higher education in this country started uh, at a place that, well, didn't start equitably, but um, uh, where it is today is federal funding has decreased significantly state funding has decreased significantly. Yep. And so when you look at the funding and, and what, a, you know, an institute, a, you know, an institution's budget used to look like 30, 40 years ago. And, you know, what percentage came from the federal government, what from, um, from state, what from potentially county, and then tuition and fees. Tuition and fees was not the highest. Right. It was, it was that government funding, be it at the local up to, to the federal level. It's completely flipped. And you look at uh, institutions' budgets now, and they're primarily um, tuition and fee driven, tuition and and, fee. and that's why the prices have risen, and unfortunately, and so it, it has happened on the backs of students, and um, because it sadly it is the, in some to some institutions the only way that they can keep the doors open and survive and continue to innovate and stay uh, stay as modern as possible with the needs of our students, with you know, technology changes, uh, and just the changing environment that we're, we continuously live in. Um, so that is a huge region, reason why there's this competition. You're also seeing competition because now you're, we're talking about um, uh, um, you know, college promise programs and making college free. And um, starting with the community colleges, but now that's, that's changing. In my state in New Jersey, they've, uh, they've um, passed a, a law for the Garden State uh, Initiative. And I'm not saying that 
quite um, correctly, but it's essentially saying that an, an, um, a, a student who first uh, goes to community college for two years and they um, access potentially CCOG, which is the community college opportunity grant, if their family makes 65,000 or less. After completion of their two years at a community college, they can transfer to any of the four year state institutions in the state of New Jersey and then get their last two years for free as well through this Garden State initiative. Um, so, you know, that that bill or that law sort of tried to make it equitable, right? So that it wasn't like, you know, we're, we're serving the needs of the two year, but also the four year. Uh, just this week, Rutgers came out and was in the news. I don't know if you saw it, that they are now upping the state and, and offering this wonderful program to students for all four years. Right. And so, you know. Competition. Competition. Yep. And we're, their, we're one of their largest uh, transfer partners. Right. So, right. you know, um, I think what that says to me uh, is as a community college administrator, we have to, to continuously think about who our population is. Because in the, in the county of Middlesex, 54% of the population has no degree. They either have- What was the number, 54%? 54%. And no we're degree. a high, we have, you know, and 46% have a degree or higher, right? So they either have an associate's degree or up to a terminal degree. But 54% of the residents of this county either have some college and no degree, they just have a high school diploma or they don't have a high school diploma at all. So that's a large percentage. Right. And um, there are some families, many families and many communities in Middlesex County where community college makes more sense because it can go straight to a job that pays really, really well. Right. Or you can go the transfer path or you can go to a job that pays really well and transfer at the same time. And, and continue that and continue to support your family, but also have, you know, um, you know, pursue your educational goals. So we have to reimagine what our student populate, who our student population is in the primary students. We're traditionally as a comprehensive community college, very focused on your traditional student coming straight out of high school, go straight to, to Middlesex, but that's shifting. Uh, the majority of our students are part-time. The majority of our students have children or are taking care of aging parents or grandparents or their siblings are taking care of their siblings. Right. So um, there is a place for community colleges still, but just like the four years, we have to continue to stay on top of, of how our, our world is changing, uh, how our, the dynamics are shifting in our, in our region and ensure that we, um, keep top of mind that we do still have a place in the market and be sure that we uh, communicate that and sell the value of a two-year degree. And I have a suggestion for that. So, you know, going back to your students, right? So typically when a, when a student graduates from college, regardless of the college type, they cut ties, right? And unless they're giving back some money, they really don't have any reason. Few universities and colleges bring back their stars, the people like their sports players who are great or a person who graduated and became a president of a company or something and bring them back too. But why not bring back that average student as a face of the school to talk about his or her experience and to be an ambassador for recruiting and alumni don't, don't, don't phone, you know? So, so because if you aren't, you know, if you only want to pick out the stars, we all know who they are. They align yeah. very nice and they shine brightly. Yeah. But it's those people that are not shining are the people that really are good because they, there are more people like them than they yeah. are the stars, right? Absolutely. So, and I don't understand why universities don't think that these are the people who graduated from my school, not they're, they're living a productive life. They're contributing to society. They're paying their taxes. They're doing all the things that we expected them to do, but yet still we treat them like they are foreign wow. things. So my universe, my, my historically black college shit, used to send me a letter almost every week asking me to donate to the university to something. They got a band drive, they got whatever, they've got something, right? And I, was, and I would just delete, hit the delete button or put it in the trash if it was a physical letter. And, you know, I started thinking about that. You know, my university, neither of my universities has ever acknowledged what I contributed or continue to contribute to society. And so I, I'm not valued. 
if we started valuing the people who came through our colleges, whether they became a star or not, we would get more students to come back and see the value because that person who went to middle sex became a, a mechanical engineer or you know whatever he or she did is a positive member of your community and reaching out, asking them to come speak to students, you know, come tell them their experience would be a way to change that competitiveness. Because if you get your students excited about it, past and present, you will drive more funds to your university. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. You're, you're absolutely right. And those, those, those stories are so important. And it's one of the things that I continue to drive home with my marketing and communications team is that we need to tell the story of Middlesex College. And that happens in a number of ways, right? It's through our faculty, it's through our alums, it's through our current students. And it's not everyone where it's like, oh, look, they, they won this prestigious award. But I did say, you know, people are very interesting beyond what they do every day for a job. You know, we have faculty that do all sorts of incredible things out. I mean, they do incredible things inside the classroom, but some of the things they do outside and what they do, you know, because they just love to do it or it's a hobby. Those are such cool things. And those are the stories we need to tell because students really want to know that too, right? Like students choose an institution because of the faculty, right. not because of people like me. <laughs> they, yeah. they, choose, they choose the institution because they, they connect with a faculty member or they came on a visit and they had a certain experience that made them feel a certain way. And, um, and so we have to keep telling that story. And you're absolutely right. Telling the story of all of our alums is really important. And I think that's a, it's, a, it's an important job and, think, and, and thing to keep top of mind with your alumni uh, engagement office is how do we connect with alums? And, it can't just be you send out, okay. Massive yes, emails. Yes, yes. Oh, it's that time of year. We got to send out the email. And then three months later, we're going to hit them with a direct mail letter. It's got to be, okay, fine. Send your email if you really got to do it. But also we have to make deeper connections and carve out time to do that. Yeah. And and, 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 and I'm, I, I agree with you completely. And I, I don't want to harp on it, but I would just say, you know, the class of 2011, you know, who were the students in the class of 2011, if you had a yearbook or something, bring all of them back to the school? Because one, now they know that you know they exist. They weren't just somebody paying you money to go there, but it also gives them an incentive and a voice and a commitment to the university. So they're going to fight for you too. And I think, you know, we underestimate word of mouth. We underestimate word of mouth because people tell their experience. Oh, that was a horrible college. Oh, this is what happened to me. This is my experience. But those things lead to dollars or no dollars, one way or the other. So, so there's worries about that. Okay, I'm done bothering you about endowments. I no, think I'm, taking, I'm taking notes because you're absolutely right. And this is something we've talked about, but I think given you know the pandemic and having to be remote for as long as we have had to, we're now just coming back to campus, that this would be an optimal time to reevaluate you know, the, cap the capacity to do something like that, to have sort of like a, class reunion for different decades. You know, we've talked about that in the past and always kind of been like, uh, should we do it, shouldn't we? But this might be the right time to do that, right? Um, because people are kind of um, feeling a little caged up and, and want that connection. And this would be a great way to get people onto campus and um, us connecting with them and them with each other. Yeah, and if you think back early Harvard days, Harvard used to produce a book, it wasn't a magazine, of their uh, rising students. So, uh, you know, you would hear of a student who graduated from Harvard or did something and they would just do a little story and they'd send it out in their newsletter of that student. And, and what they did was very detailed and, you know, all his letters and all that stuff. But but this something simpler, like, so, Absolutely. you know, if you took you where you went to school, if your school recognized um, doc, future Dr. Michelle Campbell, uh, <laughs> you know, attended this school, this, this is, and look at her now, you know, and, and, and it doesn't have to be detailed or frothy or any of that stuff, but just enough for people to realize that they care about their students. And it's simply that, because I think in a lot of, a lot of ways, our society has lost the ability to care. 
And I understand it makes perfectly good sense. You got COVID, you got crisis, wars, all kinds of stuff going on around us. And so we internalize. But in order for the society to move forward, we must externalize. We have to reach out to others and we have to help others. And, you know, whether this, this is not about race, age, gender, or any of that stuff, it's just about making our world better. And when you have a tool like a university where you graduated from, you did not drop out, you completed. That's something the university to, should tout because you know how important completion rates are, right? So absolutely, especially for what little bit of federal funding you will get, the I, completion exactly. rates matter. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so I'm done talking about that. So I want to <laughs> talk about you now. So what made you decide the career that you're in? So how did you come to this? Was this something you always knew you wanted to do, or was this kind of a happenstance or accidental? You know, it's funny because um, I feel like most of well, at least uh, maybe maybe nowadays uh, people go to college knowing they want to work in higher ed. But uh, when I was going to school, uh, getting my bachelor's, I had no idea. I just it's I, I sort of say I went to college and I just decided I never wanted to leave. So I figured out how I could keep how I could beautiful. stay. Um, so you know, I I interned in the athletic communications office and really liked it, and and I just kind of stayed in higher ed. I. I um, worked for the university in New Zealand that I got my master's degree at, the University of Waikato. And, um, and then when I was coming back to the States, I got a job at a community college. And that was really my first time I had been introduced to two-year institutions. Prior to that, it was always at a four-year institution. And loved it, loved it, loved it. Uh, I then moved to California and, because I was like, I can't live in Nebraska too long. This is killing me. I was in it's a huge it's culture cold. It's shock. Cold. It's cold. Oh, it was such a culture shock coming from New Zealand and living there for three years to moving to rural Nebraska in literally the middle of what felt like nowhere. And I was, I was, you know, I was in my late twenties, and it was just not the right place for me at that time. It was a wonderful place for people who want to have kids and settle down. Um, but at that point, I was like, oh gosh, I have to, I have to find something else. Um, so I moved to California and I worked at Alliant International University in San Diego. And that um, is a private institution that primarily serves, um, primarily awards masters and doctorates. They do have some bachelor's programs, but they're primarily graduate. <clears throat> Loved it again. I was like, higher ed is my thing. Um, and then I found my way up to Seattle, Washington at another two-year institution at a technical college, Brenton Technical College and was there for five years before coming here to Middlesex. I've always sort of been in institutional advancement. Um, I sort of started in the research realm, then sort of, well, I started in the communications realm and journalism, and then, you know, to research and then to grants, and then sort of in more of a leadership capacity at my previous institution and now here. So, um, you know, there were times along the way where I was like, is this really what I want to do? I'm not really sure. I'm going to have to get a doctorate. And is that what I want to do? And, you know, it, I did have, there was a pivotal moment for me where I, I made the decision that this is what I'm going to do. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to, um, I'm going to shoot to be a president someday. Um, I was working in Seattle or in Seattle. From, and, your, from your lips to God's ears, our president one day. Don't don't take that lightly. That's a pretty powerful statement. Yes. From your lips to God's ears. Yeah. I figure I have to say it. And then, you know, I can't roll my words back. That's sort of my thing. If I make it public, then I can't, I have to, I have to keep going. You have to keep um, going. But um, I did have a period in Seattle where I, I you know, contemplated leaving higher ed and did for a very brief moment, like eight weeks. And my boss said, please come back. I want to give you this new job. And I want you to lead our um, institutional advancement division. I'm going to form a new division. And this is what I, I want you to do. And I knew that that was the right step. I knew that I had made a mistake for leaving and was like, you know, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, this is the, the path I'm supposed to take. So that's how I got here. Well, that's, it's a beautiful path. It's, it sounds like it's a very beautiful path and to stick with it, knowing you wanted to be in the building one way or the other, whether you were a student <laughs> or a leader, you were going to be in education. That's really great to hear. So 
let's do a little bit of uh, of uh, challenging the the narrative. What would you tell Michelle Campbell at age 10, 15, 20, and 25 that you have learned for the next Michelle Campbell that's listening to us? Oh my, that is a really great question. 10, 15, 20, and 25. You know what? Honestly, I think, you know, right off the cuff, what comes to me is um, just keep going, keep showing up, and, um, and never, never quit. You know, I think that there's a lot of things that will be thrown your way personally and professionally along your pathway. Um, you know, none of us could have, um, known that we were all going to live through this crazy last two years. Uh, and it's probably a good thing we didn't know because it has been nuts. Um, and so sometimes, uh, all you can do is show up and say, I'm going to give it my all today. And my 100% today may really only be like 50%, but it is the 100% that I can give today. And I'm going to show up every day and, um, and keep working hard and keep persisting. And usually those lulls and those bumps along the way eventually become, you know, rainbows and places where you're at a good place again. Uh, but you have to work through those. It doesn't, it doesn't come easily. And the road is always winding and bumpy. It's just part of the process. It's part of the journey. And that's something that I think I would definitely tell my younger self is that, um, you know, the journey is in fact a journey <laughs> and it's not, it yeah, is no. a long, long race. It is not a, you know, a fast little sprint and and try to find the, the, the wonderful, amazing moments, be it in your personal life or professional life along the way, because those are the things that kind of get you through those hard, those hard times, those difficult, challenging times. I couldn't have said it better myself. So, so my last question is this. Now, what about community? How do you feel about building a network or a community of people around you? And do you consider yourself an advocate? Um, I think it's incredibly important. I love people. I love socializing. I love being out in the community. I, um, I try to network as much as possible. I have several groups of, of, um, of women leaders from other institutions around the nation, but also in the state of New Jersey. I am one of those people that stay in contact with my, my colleagues. So I frequently um, find time to schedule Zoom meetings and sessions or chats with my colleagues back out in Washington still, because I think it's really important to keep those connections with people. Um, I, as far as an advocate, I think I'm a huge advocate, obviously, for, for equity and for students and to, to be that person can, that can help affect change and sort of hopefully you know, level the playing field for everybody to have an opportunity to get the education and the, and the career or job that they want and to, to help remove barriers for, for individuals. Um, I would also say I'm a huge advocate for uh, uh, women and women leadership. And that's something that's really important to me um, is to continue to develop the women that work under me and lift them up. Uh, and not just those that work directly with me, but indirectly, because I think it's really important that women have a space to uh, talk about what it means to be a woman in, um, in a certain profession or in leadership, because it is a different journey. It's a different path. There's different challenges than there are for men. And um, I think for women, sometimes it's, I know that it's very important to just have a safe space where you can talk about anything. Um, because we often feel like we're the only person going through what we're going through, uh, because we often don't have somebody we can talk to about it. Right. Uh, and the only way we know and feel like we can get through this moment, this crazy moment of parenting or whatever it is, um, is when we reach out and realize that, oh my gosh, all of these other women I know are having the same challenges as me. And just knowing that they're going through the same thing helps you move forward. Uh, so that is something I'm very passionate about and that I really work. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on a few boards that are for women leadership and it's something that is really important to me. 
Well, that's perfect. I think you said it as well as it could be said. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Same here. And once the video converts, I will send you a link. Please watch and let me know Absolutely. if I may upload it. Thank you so I much. Really Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.